And I am excited to be back in the pulpit preaching God's word and back in the book of Joshua. And we are starting a new sermon series this morning called Defining Moments, Building a Lasting Legacy. And we're here and we're having this sermon series because in just four weeks from today, we have a very monumental day that's coming up in the history of our church. Does anybody know what it is? The 50th anniversary, that's right. Our church was started in the middle of the summer, and we are four weeks away from celebrating 50 years of God pouring out his goodness and his blessing on this church, and I can't tell you how excited I am about even the lead up to that over the next four weeks, but then that whole weekend. If you have not yet Mark the dates on your calendar. Make sure that you do. July 8th is a Saturday night at 6 p.m. We are going to be in here for services at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss that. That night we're going to have Brother Walker with us. He's our founding pastor. We're going to have Brother Stewart who also helped Brother Walker start the church, pastor the church for 25 years. We're going to do a question and answer from them. I promise you this. You will be challenged that night. They have some incredible stories about God and how he worked and some of the incredible things that he did. We're going to be challenged. It's going to be an awesome night that night. Then we're going to have a dessert reception to follow next door. So make sure you're here for that. And then Sunday morning, we're going to have a big celebration here. We want you to invite people. We have cards that you can get at the door on your way out. We want people to come and see all that God has done and all the ways that God has been blessing our church. Hasn't God been good to us? Are you thankful for this church? I'm thankful for this church. I, I can't, I, I'll say it again. I miss you all when we are gone. There is no place like home. And to me, there is no place like West Florida Baptist Church. I am thankful for you and for God's people here. I'm excited about where we're at in the book of Joshua. We're gonna be talking about over the next four weeks, some very defining moments here in the book of Joshua. And guess what? They are the same defining moments that our church has experienced over the past 50 years, and they will continue to be the same defining moments that we will continue to experience if God's gonna continue to bless our church in incredible ways. To me, this is so important because I believe that we have to answer a question over the next, as, as we go through these next few weeks and as we come up to our 50th anniversary. And the question is this, what are we gonna do with all that God has given us and all that God has blessed us with? I believe with all my heart that as we enter our 51st year as a church, that we are at just as an important of a defining moment as we have ever been. Because what we do in our first 51st year is just as important as what we did in our first year. Because the same faith that it took to start West Florida Baptist Church is the same faith that is required to continue to enable us to reach this community and to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't ever want the light to go out and we cannot become complacent and we cannot sit back and just rest and enjoy all that God's given us. We've got to take what's been given to us and we've got to steward it well for the advancement of God's kingdom and for his honor and for his glory. And so I want our church to be challenged and I hope God breathes a new, fresh fire in us as we move forward and as we look to see and enjoy all that God's gonna continue to do. The first defining moment that we're gonna talk about this morning is an impossible experience. An impossible experience. I love words like this. Go ahead and put that next one up on the screen, the next slide up on the screen. But I love words like this, because if you look at it, it says impossible, but what do you all see? There's only two letters that start that word, but what do you see in the rest of that word up there on the screen? Possible, possible. You know what, the last time I checked, we believe that God can do the impossible around here. Can I get an amen to that? I mean, did you see all the things that that video just covered and talked about? We believe that God created this world in six literal days. And by the way, I think it takes way more faith to believe that all of this just happened by accident, that a bunch of molecules just crashed together and over billions of years, we ended up where we are today. It takes a whole lot less faith to believe that there is an intelligent designer and there is an intelligent creator that put all of this together with just a spoken word. I believe every miracle of the Bible to be true. I believe that God parted the Red Sea. I believe that God parted the Jordan River and allowed the children of Israel to enter into the promised land on dry ground. I believe that God enabled the walls of Jericho to fall down. And I believe with all my heart, the miracle that we're looking at today absolutely happened and absolutely took place because our 
God is a God of the impossible. And he loves nothing more than to show that to us in real and incredible ways. How many of you right now can stop and think about some impossible things that God has done in your life? Maybe it was in saving you. Maybe he provided for you in incredible ways, but we all can look back at impossible experiences that have happened. Do you know what the defining moment is for our church as we continue to move forward? Here's the defining moment. It comes down to this. Either we believe in a God that can do anything, or we settle for a Christian faith that is non-miraculous. That's what it all boils down to. As we enter our 51st year, either we believe in a God that can do anything, or we're going to settle for a non-miraculous faith, and we're just going to go through the motions. You know what? I want to continue to see God do the impossible. Have you ever stopped and thought about how much faith it takes to start a church? I think about, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I think about Brother Walker. I think about him and his wife. They were just out of Bible college, and God put a burden on their heart to move to Milton, Florida, with a very young family at that time, to a church on its inaugural Sunday that I believe had um, eight to ten members somewhere around there that they started the church with. I think there was maybe 13 people total in attendance on that first Sunday in the second week of July back in 1973. And here we are 50 years later, and look at all that God has done. You know, I, I know that, that Brother Walker and them, they, they believed that God could do some things, but I also believe with all my heart that God has done exceeding abundantly above anything that they could have ever asked or thought. This has far exceeded any of their dreams and any of their expectations, but people took a step of faith and they followed God and they put themselves in an impossible situation. And guess what? God delivered and God showed up and they knocked on doors and they invited people to church. And here we are all these years later because our God does impossible things. I don't know about you, but here's where I want my life to be. When my life is all said and done, and when the final history of this church is written one day, I would love nothing more than in big, bold letters for it to be said, an impossible experience. Because upon further examination, Everything about this church, everything about my life personally, everything about your life personally, when people look close, they shouldn't see us and they shouldn't see good human beings. They should be able to look right through that and see a God of the impossible. And that's where I want to live. And that's where I want our church to live. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. How can we make sure that we are experiencing the impossible on a regular basis. Let's jump right into it. I only got two points today, and most of it is practical application. And by the way, we have a really awesome story here. Were you guys following along as we did the scripture reading this morning? We got some absolutely incredible stuff that we're gonna cover here this morning. So let's jump right into it. The first point that we're gonna talk about is this. Know your limits. Know your limits. Look at verse one of Joshua chapter 10. It says this. Now it came to pass... When Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty." Let me bring you up to speed on where we're at here in the book of Joshua. Adonizedek, he is the king of Jerusalem. He's a very smart man. He wakes up and he starts thinking about the things that have happened recently around him. And he realizes Jericho was utterly destroyed. Those walls came crumbling down. And Ai was utterly destroyed. And our neighbors, the Gibeonites, one of the royal cities full of mighty men, you know what they did? They tricked the nation of Israel into making peace with them, and now they're not on our side anymore. And you know what he started to understand? Individually, I am absolutely no match for the nation of Israel. So you know what Adonizedek does? There's some big names in here, okay? So if we stumble on some of those today, just be patient, all right? Adonizedek, smart man that he is, decides to form a coalition. 
And so he reaches out to four of the neighboring city-states that were around him. They decide to set aside their differences, and they decide to join together. Their only chance that they had is if they join forces and they go at Israel as a united front. But guess where they decide to start? Everybody look at verse 4. Look what it says. And I need you to fill in a blank with me, so pay attention as we read this verse. It says this. Come up unto me and help me, that we may smite who? That we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Now, put yourselves in the Gibeonites' position here. The Gibeonites had just gotten themselves out of a big mess, only to find themselves in another big mess. And how many of you say right now, that sounds like the story of my life? A lot of people are laughing at that right there. This is the Gibeonites. I mean, they had made some pretty smart, calculated, full of faith moves. They did, got themselves out of a mess. Now, all of a sudden, they created new enemies, the, the people that were surrounding them. And when they formed this coalition of forces, they decide that the first people that they're going to attack is the Gibeonites. You want to talk about, to me, one of the most surprising things from the book of Joshua that I have uncovered in my study it's the Gibeonites. I got to tell you this morning, I love the Gibeonites. These are some of my favorite new people, okay? And they've been around for a long time. But man, I like some of the moves that they make. And guess what the Gibeonites do here in Joshua chapter 10? They ask for help. Look at verse 6. It says, And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. Now, imagine being one of the people in the children of Israel. Anybody think that you, if you were one of the children of Israel, that when the Gibeonites, who were supposed to be your enemies, had just tricked you into making a peace treaty with you, now they're all of a sudden asking for you to come help and come to their defense. How many of you think that the children of Israel were probably just like, yeah, we get to go defend the Gibeonites. I can just imagine a big giant eye roll like, oh my goodness, here we go again. Already we're running into a problem, but God has an incredible way of working, even in ways that, that we don't think he's always going to work. And I love the Gibeonites because these people were absolutely not afraid to ask for help. Gibeonites are awesome. Here, here's a couple things you got to know about them. They knew their limits, okay? They understood when they were beat, and they were not afraid to ask for help, all right? So they knew their limits. They understood when they were beat. They were not afraid to ask for help. How many of you think those are some pretty good rules to follow in life? As human beings, we have limits, right? As human beings, it's really good to understand when we are beat and when we are defeated, and it is really, really, really good when we humble ourselves and when we ask for help, especially when we turn our attention to God and we ask the one who is able to do the impossible to help us. And the practical application about knowing your limits is just understanding right off the bat that as fallible human beings, we must ask for help. Here's what I want you all to do this morning. Okay, everybody help me right now. I need everybody to say out loud, I need help. Okay, you already ready? Here we go. I need help. Do you believe it? Let's say it one more time. Like we believe it. Just admit it this morning, okay? Therapy at church. I need help. We need help, right? Individually, we're no match for the enemy. Man, we got an enemy, don't we? And he's powerful. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And earlier I asked that question, you know, how many of you feel like your life story is you get out of one mess only to find yourself in another mess? And we chuckle and we laugh because we live in a broken, fallen world and so often it feels that way, right? And it's relentless and the enemy is pounding us. And you know what? He wants to overwhelm us and he wants us to be defeated. And as long as we're trying to rely on our own strength and our own ingenuity and our own knowledge to get us out of the situations we find ourselves in, we are going to fail, but when we recognize and understand that he is greater and he is bigger than us and we go to God for help, then we're going to find deliverance. We need help. You know what pleases God? When we humble ourselves. 
when we come to him, when we ask for help. Do you know that, that God's given us a wonderful tool and it's called prayer? You know, prayer connects us directly to the throne room of God. In the model prayer that Jesus gave us, in the Lord's prayer, we are given divine direction to ask for help. Once we are properly oriented, once we understand that we live for his glory, that it's not my will, but thine be done, that it's your kingdom come. Once, we, once our mindset is in the right place where we're not living for ourselves, but we're living for the glory of God, then you know what that prayer tells us to do? Give us this day our daily bread. Anybody need God's help today? You need God's provision for the things that you're faced with this upcoming week? Yeah, we all need God's help. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Anybody need forgiveness? Anybody mess up this morning? Where are my families that had a fight walking into church today? I haven't talked to y'all yet. How did y'all do this morning getting here? Got a thumbs up. Praise the Lord for that. I leave early, so I don't have to worry about that. I need to be filled with the Spirit as we get to church. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, we'll just leave that one alone. But we all need forgiveness, right? We're broken. You know what it says? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Have we prayed for God's protection today? Have we asked him for deliverance? Have, has, have we asked him to keep us from temptation? And if we find ourselves there for the strength to take the way out and to resist the temptation, the point is we all need help. We need it desperately, and God wants us to ask for help. You know what? As a church, corporately, we need God's help. Man, we are living in a world that is fallen and broken. We are living in a world that desperately needs Jesus. And to truly have an impact in this community for Christ in and of ourselves, it's impossible. But you know what? If we get on our knees and as we go into our 51st year, if we make prayer just as much a priority as it was in the early days, I believe with every bit of my heart that we can see revival, that we can see God impact Milton and Pace for the glory of God, that we can see a greater reach, that we can experience expand our influence for the kingdom of God all around this world if we ask for help. Amazing things happen when we ask for help. On our trip, we decided to bite the bullet, okay? And our first day, we left two weeks ago on Friday, and our first day, we were going to leave here, and we drove all the way to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is 1,300 miles. I told a few people what we were doing, and they said, you are crazy, and I said, yeah, we are, but we're used to driving. My mom and dad live in New Jersey. It was only like 150 miles more than that. So we decided we were just going to get the big majority of the traveling out of the way and then just have short trips from there. So we left early in the morning, and man, Alana and I were just talking about how smooth the day had been. The traveling was going so awesome, and we were 19 miles from the hotel that I had booked, and the transmission on the van goes out, and praise be to God, we were able to coast off of the interstate. There was an exit ramp that just happened to be right there and we coasted all the way down the exit ramp. I turned off onto the road, got off to the side and the next thing you know, the whole front engine was smoking like crazy and Atlanta screams, everybody out. <laughs> so all the kids are barreling out of the van. We had driven 1,100 miles. We thought the van was on fire and gonna blow up and everyone's out. We left Florida, it was like 90 degrees. It was 48 degrees. I had all my jackets packed up. We were grabbing blankets. It was freezing cold. It would have been a long day of traveling. And we were in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. Now, all my friends that go to church here from New Mexico, that whole row, raise your hands up high right now. You see that man on the far right right there? Sid, raise your hand. Sid was the chief deputy of the sheriff's department out there in Albuquerque. All those people, you know what they tell me? How dangerous Albuquerque, New Mexico is. <laughs> now I'm scared. I'm like, I'm broke down on the side of a highway and I'm going to get mugged before I can get anywhere. They're all nodding their heads. They're like, oh my goodness, you ought to be scared out of your minds. So we're broke down in the middle of nowhere. And I, I, I called our roadside assistants. I wasn't getting very far with them. They weren't much help. They were like, it's delayed. We can't get anybody to respond to come tow you. And I'm like, oh no. So I thought about something. I said, you know what I need to do? I need to ask for help. And the motel that we were staying in, it was right on historic Route 66 in a little town called Moriarty, about, six, about 30 miles or so outside of Albuquerque. And we were 19 miles from that hotel. And I remember reading that it was a family-owned business, 
from like the 1960s or whatever. So I had already called the guy earlier and told him we were gonna check in late. And I called him back, it's 11.30 at night. And I'm like, um, I got a problem. I said, we broke down, I'm 19 miles away. I got a family, like the tow truck people said, if they do ever get here, that they can only take two of us. I got six people. I don't think I can call an Uber out here. Um, so is there any way you could come pick me up? You don't know me from Adam and it's late at night. <laughs> come pick me up. <laughs> Who wants to get a call like that? And you know what that guy said? He's like, yeah, I got one more person to check in. I'll, I'll take care of it, and I'll be right on my way. But he's like, hey, call Taverners. They're a really good tow truck service. Lo and behold, I didn't know this at the time, but Sorsha and her daughters had done some gymnastics with his daughters, a small town out there. And, uh, man, that guy, Mike, he was so friendly at night, and he sent another guy out to pick us up. You know, that guy towed us. He came back the next morning and checked on us. We get to the hotel that night. I, he was able to get all six of us in, so I told Mike at the hotel. It's another Mike. There's a lot of Mikes in this story, okay, <laughs> if you get confused. So Mike at the hotel, we, I said, you don't need to come pick us up. We're good to go. We get there that night. I'll tell you what. He made sure we had a tow truck driver. He made sure we got to the right mechanic. He made sure that we weren't going to get ripped off. He told me the next morning, he's like, hey, whatever you need. He's like, we're full tonight. But I took our biggest room and I set it to the side. If your family needs it, all you got to do is let me know. And then the most incredible thing, the next day, he gave me a ride 45 minutes away to the airport to pick up a rental car. He reoriented his whole schedule to make sure that we had the help that we needed. It was almost like an angel unawares. And I share this story with you just to point out the fact that when we ask for help, it's amazing what God does. And that's just a silly illustration. It was pretty important at 1130 at night when you're on the side of the road with your family and you don't know what you're going to do in the middle of nowhere. But the same thing goes in even the bigger situations of life that really matter. When we ask God for help, everything is already laid out right there ready for you to step right into it. Know your limits. Know that we need help. Learn from the Gibeonites. Don't be afraid to ask for it right away. I need help. I need help. God never gets tired of delivering on his promises. And he never gets tired of helping his children. He delights in it. Know your limits. Second thing I want you to see this morning, though, is no, no limits. I love this right here. No, no limits. When we know our limits and when we go to God for help and we put ourselves in the posture of humility and we are constantly relying on God for everything that we need, guess where we get to live our lives every day? In the realm of the impossible. No, no limits. Look how this plays out. This is all practical application. First thing I want you to see is we got to believe God's promises. Look at verse 7. It says here in Joshua chapter 10, verse 7, it says, So Joshua Ascend it from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, everybody read those next three words out loud together. Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. To this point in time, I believe that this was the biggest battle that they were facing because it was different than Jericho where they walked around the walls. They were gonna fight this enemy, five city states, five powerful kings all together out in the open in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I guarantee you there was a lot of fear that was creeping through the nation of Israel. They were about to go into a battle with the greatest enemy that they had faced up to this point in time. And how does God encourage them? God encourages them not with some new promise, not with some new revelation. You know how God encourages them? With the same promises that he had already given them before in the past. If you went all the way back to Joshua chapter one right now, in the very early verses after Moses died, you would find God telling Joshua that I will be with you. And as you go through the promised land, no man will be able to stand before you. And you know what God does right here in Joshua chapter 10? He reiterates the same promise that had already been given don't fear, Joshua. Go up and fight the battle. I've delivered them into your hand. Remember, no man shall stand before you. I am a God of the impossible, and I do not change. And the same promise I gave you before is just as true today. And you know what we all need to understand and know this morning? That the same promises that God gave thousands of years in, ago in his word are just as sufficient to fulfill and to meet every single need that we have in life today. We don't need new revelation. 
We don't need new promises. We have everything that we need right here in God's word. I got a question for you today. Are you in a battle? I actually got an exercise I want you to do this morning. Everybody take out a piece of paper. If you're not taking notes or get out your phone, get something that you can write something down on. I want you to write down your battle. What's, what's the biggest battle that you're faced with right now? What's the biggest thing? that what, what, what kept you up last night? Or what's kept you up more recently this past week? Maybe it's a job situation. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a, a family situation. But what is it? Are you in a battle? I know the truth is we're all in a battle. We are fighting a battle. All right, so once you identify, what is that battle? Well, here's the next thing. I want you to write down. Maybe you have it right now. And maybe you don't, and this is the homework that you have to take with you. But what promise of God are you claiming for victory in the battle that you're fighting right now? We're all in a battle, right? But what promise of God are you claiming? I was thinking about this. I, I believe the battle that if someone, if, if any of you have asked me in the past couple of years, how can I pray for you? The first thing that I always say is my family. I want to raise godly children. I don't want to just raise good children. I want my children to be godly. I want them to find God's will for their lives, to live in the center of God's will, because I know that that's where they're going to find the blessings of God poured out on their lives. And you know what? To raise godly children in our world today is fighting a battle. We have a world system that is completely stacked against us. We have Satan is powerful, and he set up everything to draw our children, to draw us into the world and into temptation. And you know what God's told me to do in his word? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, when you wake up, when you walk, when you sit down, when you go to bed, teach them diligently my statutes. My job as a dad, my job as a parent is to, in every situation, every chance I can, to point them to the truth of God's word. Ephesians chapter 6 tells me as a dad to provoke not my children under wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. My job is to saturate my home and my children's lives with the truth and the teaching of God's word. You know what the promise is that I'm claiming? Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto view void, but it shall accomplish whatsoever I need to read it to you. I don't have it all the way memorized. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. My job as a dad is not to get sidetracked by how messed up this world is and by all the temptations and all the problems that are out there. Yes, I'm to be on guard and I'm to be paying attention and I'm to saturate my home with the truth. But my job as a dad is to live full of faith and to claim the truth of his word and to believe wholeheartedly that it will penetrate their hearts, that it will penetrate their minds. And someday it will click and it will make a difference. And it will not return to me void. And listen, if your children, if you've done that and your children have strayed, our job is to never lose sight of who God is and the truth of his word and to continue to pray and to continue to believe because there is nobody that is ever too far from God and there is no situation that is too impossible for our God. Our job is to be filled with faith and to believe God's promises. So what battle are you in? What promise are you claiming? Believe God's promises. Then you know what we do? We attack the enemy. We attack the enemy. Look at verse nine. It says this, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. He does another incredible military maneuver. He moves instantly. He uses the cover of darkness to put his, his military into an attack position. And the next morning when they wake up, man, he hits them with a surprise attack and We'll see in a little bit what happens, okay? But he hits him with a surprise attack, an incredible military move. You know what the practical application is from this? As believers, as God's children, he has not called us to play defense, but to be on offense, to attack. You know what he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Do you know what gates are? Gates are defensive, Back in the, in, the old, in the Bible times, they would have understood this. They built every city with walls or fences around it. Even in this passage, you'll see that the people fled into gate cities, into walled cities for protection. Do you understand what he told his disciples? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Our job as God's people is not to be hiding in fear, not to be cowering, not to be building these 
big, safe walls around our churches and in our homes. But our job is to take the insulation of the Holy Spirit and to charge and to storm the gates of hell and to get outside these walls and into our communities and into our neighborhoods and lift high the name of Jesus and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gates of hell will not prevail against a church that is on the move. You know, a couple things. One, for you personally, when we go back to that battle that you're in, the battle that you're faced with and the promise, what action move are you going to take? God's promises demand us to act. We can't just sit back in fear and not do anything until God shows up and delivers. No, we've got to take another step. So in your life personally, what's the next step that God wants you to take? What's the action step that you can take to remind Satan once and for all that he's been defeated? Attack. Obey God. Do what you know is right to do and keep moving on. Then God's going to show up and he'll deliver. As a church. Oh, man, there's all kinds of ways we could apply this. But I just want to say one way. Out in that hallway, we have the sign. Love God, love others, right? You know, the best way for our church to stay in a position of attack is if we truly, genuinely love our neighbor as ourself. And we live in America and we are blessed. There are churches all over the place. And in one sense, I think that that's a good thing because the light of the gospel, man, even as we drove through the country, I saw lots of billboards. There is still a light of Jesus and the presence of Jesus in our world today. But one of the downsides of that is we have made church all about me. It's all about my preference. It's all about liking the preacher, liking the style of music, or whatever the case may be. Can I tell you that at some point, at some point, we have got to understand and recognize that the world is quickly going to hell and that those things are not as important as advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at some point, we've got to get our minds off of what we like and what we're interested in, and we've got to start thinking about others. And we've got to come to church, and we've got to say, hey, there's people that are sitting next to me that I don't know. Maybe they're visiting, and you've got to welcome them and make them feel friendly. And you know what? You've got to understand that there's people outside these doors that are lost and in need of somebody to tell them the gospel of Jesus and to point them to the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know what we ought to be dreaming about? You know what we ought to be scheming about is how can we reach more people for Christ and are there any walls and what barriers can be removed so that way our church can have the greatest impact in this community that it can possibly have it's our job to be on the offensive to storm the gates of hell and you might be sitting there wondering well well what does that mean if things change what what does that mean does that mean we're going to go too far no because you know what holds us back we're never going to compromise on the truth of God's word We will never compromise on the truth of God's word. This book is true from cover to cover, and we need to believe it. This is our anchor. And you know what? We need to take the gospel and the truth of his word, and we need to storm the gates of hell and this community, and we need to attack the enemy. And when we do that, guess what's going to happen? We will experience God's power. Look at verses 10 and 11. It says, And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth the Beth Huron, and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. Amazing things happen in verse 10. But look at verse 11. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Huron that the Lord, y'all see this right here? Everybody read this next part with me out loud. Ready? Here we go. That the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. All right, are you ready for this? When you believe God's promises, when you're attacking the enemy, you're going to start experiencing God's power. Here is a truth that you cannot miss. When we are doing right, when we are in the center of God's will, all of the power of heaven and earth begins to work for us. Even in the sense, now, the Bible's extreme and it has extreme examples, but in this particular example, God sent hailstones out of heaven and more of the enemy died from those divine bullets than they did from the sword of the children of Israel. And you know what even gets better? Man, when you start getting in the fight and you start seeing God delivering on his promises, man, you start getting invigorated on the inside and you start feeling like, this is awesome. This is what I've been missing. This is where I want to live. I'm experiencing God doing incredible things. Guess what happens? Your faith gets bigger and your prayers get bigger. 
Because look at what Joshua does in verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And I love verse 14. And there was no day like that before it or after it. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. That the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. And then what's that last phrase say? For the Lord fought for Israel. Can I get an amen right there? You see what happened and took place? And they started experiencing God. Hailstones start flying out of heaven. Bullets are coming out of heaven, just wiping out the enemy. But Joshua wants to end it in that day. And in, I believe, inspiration from the Holy Spirit. And in the moment, he calls out to God and he says, God, help the sun to stand still. Help the moon to stand still. And God did that. And there has not ever been a day like unto it since because the Lord fought for Israel. And you might be sitting here saying, I don't know if I can believe that. That sounds pretty incredible. So does God creating the earth in six days. So does the Red Sea parting. So does the fact that I am saved and a child of God and on my way to heaven. So does the fact that Jesus came and he went to a cross and he died and he rose again from the grave. Either we believe in a God that can do the impossible or we settle for a Christian faith that is non-miraculous. You know what will change your life more than anything? To get in the fight claim God's promises, start attacking that enemy, and all of a sudden your prayer life is going to change and your personal experiences are going to change and you are gonna see God moving and working. And here's the last thing that I want you to see and understand today. My last point is this, cash that check. Cash that check. Now I'm gonna get to this check in just a second. I love how this story ends. In the middle of the fight, They come across the five kings, and these five powerful kings are now hiding in a cave. So they send back to Joshua, what do you want us to do? And Joshua says, put stones over the cave, put a couple men there to guard them, but then the rest of you keep fighting. Don't don't get sidetracked by these kings. We'll come back and deal with them later. Go get the enemy and end this battle today. So that's what they do. So they put them in the cave. When the battle's done, God had given them complete defeat. Joshua has all of the army of Israel assembled together together. And he goes and he gets those five kings and he brings them out of the cave. And you know what he does to those kings? He lays them down on the ground, on their faces. He puts their faces in the dirt. And he has all of the captains of the army of Israel come up one at a time to those five kings. And he tells them to stand there and to put their feet on their necks. Now you might start thinking, this sounds pretty, pretty intense. It is pretty intense. How this whole passage ends, but it's war. This was also some things that were very customary at that time. But he tells them to put their feet on their necks. Now, just put yourself in their position. These kings, just 24 hours earlier, seemed to be so powerful and so daunting. But now that God had stepped in and now that God had done the work, he shows us a true picture of what the enemy actually looks like. When we're asking God for help and we're experiencing his power, that powerful enemy that we're faced with, the the battles that we were talking about earlier, He's defeated. You know what Romans 16, 11 tells us? You know how Paul ends the book of Romans in verse 16, chapter 20? He says, for the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. For the God of peace. The last thing he tells the church at Rome. The God of peace shall bruise the head of Satan under your feet shortly. We are in the position of victory, not because there's anything great about us, but because there's everything great about God. And Joshua marches all of these kings and has them lay down on their face and has all the captains come up because he wants us to see and to know the truth of verse 25. Look at 10, 25. And Joshua said unto them, fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. You see that right there? For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. You know what I think we need to do sometimes? I think we need to mentally take those battles that we're facing 
take the enemy that we're standing against, and I think we need to, to put him on the ground and to take our feet and to put it on top of him and remind him once and for all of his complete and utter defeat at the cross of Jesus Christ and the fact that as God's children, we, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Can I get an amen right there? Man, our God is good. You know what happens next? After they're done doing that, he has the kings executed. He hangs their bodies in the tree until the sun sets, and then he takes them and he puts them back in the cave and he buries it, and there's a monument that's there to this day. And you might read through the Old Testament and you might think that all oh, that sounds pretty gruesome, but you gotta understand, these were people that were under divine judgment. These were people that had a chance at mercy. These were people that blatantly rejected God. And you know what God does? He reminds us that one day we will experience complete and ultimate victory, and one day the enemy will be completely and utterly defeated and it's the exact mentality and mindset that we need to have. And why did I say the last point is that we need to cash that check is because we've got to live like we're already victorious. I brought a check with me today. I, I don't have anybody's name on it, but it's a check for $1 million. Would anybody like this check for $1 million? You guys saw your hand up right there. Come on down. Come on down. I'll give you this check. I'm going to write your name on it. What's your name? What? Wyatt Damry. Everybody give Wyatt Damry a, a warm welcome this morning. Wyatt, here you go, man. I'm putting your name on here right now, and I just wrote you a check for $1 million. Wyatt's life has changed today, folks. Give him a big round of applause. Go ahead, man. That's it. You go. Does anybody think Wyatt's going to cash that check? You can try. Go to the Santa Rosa Credit Union. They will laugh in your face. And I even put down in the comments, I said, this is not real. But God's promises are. Why? Here's what I want you to do with that. If you take that check, save it, put it at home somewhere, frame it, whatever. But just remind yourself that as awesome as that $1 million would be and how great that that would do at changing some things about your life, the promises that we have here in God's word are exponentially better than anything that we could ever imagine. Do you understand this morning? We don't need a million dollars. We have something greater and something better. We have the truth of God's word and we have a God that can do the impossible. And you know what we need to do? We need to take that to the bank and we need to cash it. And we don't just need to walk outside these doors this morning and go right back to the way that life was before, living defeated, living weighed down, living in fear, living in anxiety. No, we are the children of God and he wants to do the impossible. You know what we got to do? We got to believe it. And we got to take that check to the bank. So I challenge you this morning. I dare you under the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Not in my strength. But I do. I challenge you this morning to walk out, to look at that battle, to claim God's promise, and to remind Satan that he has been defeated, and to get up tomorrow with a conquering spirit and face the enemy head on and live in victory because God will deliver. And you know what you're going to have? You're going to have an incredible story to tell. You're going to have a testimony. Add it to the testimonies that you already have in your life. And maybe this morning you might think, I don't, I don't know. I've never really experienced something impossible in my life. Then start where you're at today. And start with the promise that God lays. Maybe you don't know what a promise is. Go Google it, man. We got Google nowadays. It makes it easy. You can Google, give me a good verse for this. And guess what? It'll show up and you can go find it in your Bible and you can read it and you can memorize it and you can claim it. And you can experience God in absolutely phenomenal ways.